Excuse me, my good man. What? I know you. Ah, Holmes, I got your message, and here I am. Let's hurry, Holmes. This neighborhood makes me ill at ease. Perfect, Watson. That oaf Bluto is looking for us with evil intentions, and he may be hiding here. I will try to get more information inside. You, Watson, will be our lookout, and at the slightest suspicious sound, do not hesitate to call a constable on his rounds. Good evening, Mr. Bully. We know each other? No. However, I have some information that may be of interest to you. Talk, my friend. A pint for you if what you say is worth something. Does it have to do with the Whitechapel murders? Indeed. I know the identity of the man who wrote a letter to the police, a letter entitled Dear Boss, in which the author claims to be the Whitechapel murderer and is signed Jack the Ripper. What? It's a journalist who is inspired by spring Jack in order to strengthen the credibility and the seriousness of his agency. This new Jack will give him some first-hand information that he, in turn, will dole out sparingly to the authorities, as well as some carefully distilled indiscretions that the big papers will come to beg of him. He plays both sides off against one another and becomes the chief orchestrator of the rumour. He wrote this letter in this very spot and he has red ink on his fingers. Like you. What exactly are you after, my friend? You've been threatening a certain squibby to distribute a telegram naming him as a possible suspect in these murders in revenge for an old feud. I would suggest you don't write this note and that you leave squibby alone. I'd forgotten about the existence of that rapscallion. I threw that at him when I was visiting the station to get the dope. You should have seen his face. You must also stop sending these letters that waste the authorities' precious time. Right, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. I have a great relationship with the Bobbies. Just ask around. I don't have to answer to nobody. Now leave me alone. Farewell, sir. Good riddance. Yes, sir. No, if Bluto sees me, it could prove to be quite dangerous. Let's hurry to the police station, Watson. We are close to our goal. Squibby will be able to reveal what he knows about Tumblety. Squibby! So that's it. You're a free man again. We were just coming to the station to find you. Shh. Yeah, the Bobbies agreed to let me go and I came to see Bluto before ferreting you out. So, you've seen the newspaper man? Yes, he is in the pub and everything is taken care of, but I'm waiting to hear what you have to say about Dr. Tumblety. Okay, but we have to be quick. One night, I goes to see Bluto in his hideout that ain't far from the boarding house where this Tumblety bloke has a room. I see him coming in too. He must have been on one real binge. To the point, the Tumbledy fellow was there, and he smiles at me, all nice like. He tells me he's a great Yankee doctor, but my business interests him. I'm interested, I tell him, but I'm not the type to just jump right in without getting to know a person, see? He invites me around to his room to talk business, just him and me. We empty a bottle or two, and all of a sudden, like, he wants to show me what he's got in this big trunk that he always carts around places. I just about vomited, see, in these jars, just like pickles, you know, there were pieces of meat. And he whispers that it's the lady bits of some old dames. He called them peckymins. I call them love killers, I would. Yuck! After that, he starts to go on about rich folk. They ain't nothing but dogs, and I won't tell you the worst of it. Then he comes all close to me and puts his sweaty hand on my leg. He was one of them types. Not me. I don't wait a second before I give him a good thrashing, and I start running and let go of him, and he still wants to see me again just to talk business. But then I had to do time, so business 
Do you know where he can be found? Why, ain't he in his digs? Maybe he got to luck in life behind bars too. I heard that in some jobs, there's a way to. Thank you for your information, and we'll meet again, my friend. Here is the sum I promised to get you out of London. Ciao, fella. I've just got a little score to settle with Bluto, and I'm heading for the country. My dear Watson, we must strike while the iron is hot. We have avoided meeting Dr. Tumblety until now. The time has come to do so. Do you have an opinion, Holmes? We must assure ourselves that the factor collector of female organs and a murderer who removes said organs are resident in the same area at the same time is nothing more than coincidence. I thought that you wouldn't bring me back your keys. It's... oh, it's you, Mr. Holmes. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Indeed, it is I again. One of your tenants left without returning his keys? Yes, it's Dr. Tumblety whom we spoke about. Shortly after your last visit here, some constables came and asked me a few questions regarding him. Barely had they left than the doctor came barreling around a street corner and rushed up into his room upstairs. A little while afterwards, while I was tidying, I heard a thud in his room and a rush down the stairs. He left with most of his bags, but without returning his keys. You can go up and see if you wish. The door is still open. Careful, Watson. Do not walk around here until I've inspected these marks. I know, Holmes, I know. I understand your methods. Ah, you have your rule and magnifying glass. I thought that you had forgotten them, Holmes. I never forget the essentials, my dear Watson. Size 13. Right foot, light trails. The man was running. This isn't water. Going by its sticky texture and odor, I'd say we're dealing with formalin. These are the footprints of a tall man who had recently stepped in formalin and who left this room in a hurry. Well, can I walk on it and enter the room now, Holmes? There are a few pieces of a large glass jar in this puddle. The man who left the footprints on the ground must have walked in it while fleeing. Eu não entendo como você se encontra nessa situação. Lembro-me do encontro em que você exclamou Vicksbury é a chave! Esta guerra nunca vai acabar até que a chave esteja no nosso bolso. Tantos mortos em Gatsbury caídos do modo que a chave deveria estar do nosso bolso no dia seguinte. If this letter is addressed to him, it would appear our doctor is a veteran of the American Civil War. Vicksburg is the key. Now, now, that is interesting. Caro Francis, é impossível nos encontrarmos novamente. Prosseguir com a nossa relação colocaria em risco tanto o meu casamento e quanto a minha reputação. Prefiro ignorar esta paixão por medo de que um dia possa me consumir totalmente. Espero que o velho esquecimento envolva nosso abraço apaixonado. Carinhosamente, Charles. Meu caro Francis, aprendi recentemente com os pincéis da lei. Você deve ser mais cauteloso. Sua atenção por hogs, jovens, ladrãozinhas, vai te custar caro um dia. Um homem da sua qualidade não deveria frequentar casebres e carregar sua pistola por toda parte. This Dr. Tumblety seems to be attracted to men more than women. That much is clear. So, the doctor has a handgun, and he would use it to restrain young men, perhaps. Thank you. 
Going by its size, this enormous trunk must be a wardrobe. These brackets are rather unusual. What do you think, Watson? Let's see, Holmes. These are the names of the battles from the American Civil War. Let's see. Five latches, each fitted with a six-number combination system. Elementary. This is dreadful, Holmes. This trunk contains four jars in which organs are floating. Watson, can you tell me at a glance what these organs are? I would say that they are parts of female reproductive organs. Are these specimens fresh? No, and I am quite certain of it. From the colour and appearance, I'd say these organs have been in these jars for several months if not years. Let's go to Baker Street. Is there someone here? Yes. What's going on, Finlay? You seem to be in a panic. The two police officers wanted to know if someone suspicious had entered here. The Whitechapel killer has struck again, and if I understood correctly, he killed two women in the past few hours. Where? I don't know. The police didn't tell me anything. Quick, Holmes. We must catch up with them. Certainly not, Watson. Mr. Finley, do you know if the doctor had any other pieces of luggage up there apart from this trunk? One or two, I think. Do you take care of the doctor's laundry? My wife does laundry for the tenants once a week. The sheets, likewise. Would you be kind enough to let us know as soon as possible if the doctor shows up again? Certainly. I'm just worried that he won't be back, you see, and I'm annoyed about my keys. Holmes, I don't follow. The Whitechapel killer is, at this very moment, very close by, and we are just staying put, twiddling our thumbs. The Whitechapel killer has always been nearby, and what will we do? Go back to the scene of the crime or crimes and mix with the onlookers and trample the crime scenes even more? No, our time will come. Let's return to Baker Street. Let's go back to Baker Street. Home, sweet home. We were less than 200 feet away from the first victim a few minutes before she was murdered. We might even have heard the murderer's voice, and we haven't done a thing for the past week. 
You're the one not doing anything, Watson. For my part, I had been working, and as you know, I've made good use of this week by tracking down and verifying all of the solid facts on these two murders to write up the notes that are on my desk. Read them over again and try to gain a bit of perspective. Nota sobre o assassinato de Liz Stride. Liz Stride, apelido Long Liz, 45 anos, altura 1,76 prostituta ocasional. A vítima foi encontrada morta por Louis G. Emsons às uma da manhã de 30 de setembro. Os dois médicos estimaram o tempo de morte após a meia-noite 46. Causa da morte, hemorragia devido a um ferimento na garganta. O local da descoberta foi no interior do pátio de Yard Dutfield. As portas que levavam até a rua Berner, em Whitechapel, a apenas alguns centímetros das instalações do Clube Internacional dos Trabalhadores. A reunião terminou por volta das 11h30 da noite. Um americano presente naquela noite disse que ele estava no pátio ao meio da meia-noite e 20 e ele foi para a rua, mas não viu nada. Duas testemunhas foram citadas pela imprensa. O policial Smith, que estava fazendo sua ronda no bairro na noite em questão, e um húngaro com o nome de Schwartz, que fez a sua declaração na delegacia acompanhado de um intérprete, pois ele não fala inglês. Nota sobre o assassinato de Catherine Edwards Catherine Edwards, 46 anos, 1,65 de altura, prostituta ocasional A vítima foi encontrada morta a 1h44 da manhã em 30 de setembro pelo policial Watkins. A vítima sofreu várias mutilações A vítima foi encontrada esticada em um canto escuro da Mitre Square Mitre Square foi visitada a 1h30 da manhã pelo policial Watkins procedendo da rua Mitre e às 4h42 pelo policial Harvey, vindo da passagem da igreja. Os dois policiais não notaram nada de suspeito na área, mas deve-se notar que o policial Harvey não entrou no Mitre Square, ao contrário do policial Watkins. O avental branco foi encontrado sobre o cadáver, com uma parte faltando. A parte faltante foi encontrada em seguida às 2h55 da manhã, na noite do assassinato, pelo policial Alfred Long, que insiste que o objeto não estava presente no momento da sua primeira patrulha, às 2h20 da manhã. O pedaço de avental manchado de sangue foi encontrado no átrio, na entrada principal para as escadas 108 e 119, Whiteworth, modelo da rua Goldstone. A inscrição a seguir foi escrita com giz bem na entrada, um pouco acima do avental. Os judeus não são os homens que serão culpados por nada. O modelo de construção das habitações Wentworth, que é quase exclusivamente ocupada por israelitas e foi decidido apagar a inscrição antes do amanhecer. I have read and reread them, but give me something to do then, a task where I can get stuck in because Find me a slaughterhouse that will give us exclusive use of its block for an hour. And find me, in your opinion, which common animal shares the most characteristics with humans from a physiological point of view? Uh, pig? I don't even know why I asked that question. Pray, find a dozen fresh pig's heads, Watson. Not big heads, I prefer small ones. Sows? That's it, Watson. As soon as you have done that, let me know. I request that you search in Whitechapel. Who knows? Perhaps you will learn something about where Dr. Tumblety may be hiding. There is also no shortage of slaughterhouses and pig's heads in those parts. You still haven't left, Watson? What a ridiculous idea to have asked Holmes for something to do. Where on earth am I going to find what he wants? Perhaps that kind Lucy will be able to help me. I must go to Miss Bella's. No, it would be better not to insist.
Good evening, Lucy. But is something wrong? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Yes, it's my uncle. He's no longer with us. Please accept my condolences, miss. Thank you, Doctor. But why are you here? Can I help you? My request may sound rather strange, but do you know if there is a butcher's or slaughterhouse in the area where pigs are killed? Uh, yes, Fletcher's the man. He was a regular client, owner of a little butcher's shop not far. But Miss Bella didn't want him to come, as long as he didn't treat his awful sickness. Can you point to his shop on my map? Certainly. Do you know anything about the two latest murders? Oh, goodness me, no. All the girls in the neighbourhood are terrified. Who will be next? That's what everyone is asking. Goodbye, Lucy. Until next time, perhaps, Doctor. Ah, there's Fletcher's butcher shop. Closed due to illness. If the proprietor is ill, the butcher's block is probably not being used. Perhaps I can use it. Now, where could a sick butcher have got to? Yes, if Fletcher is ill, he should be here. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Gibbons. I have come to see you because I was wondering if, by any chance, you happen to have a patient by the name of Fletcher, a butcher who would have relinquished his shop due to illness. An illness caught during nocturnal encounters, if you catch my drift. Fletcher is one of the regulars at the clinic. Mercury treatment against syphilis. A night with Venus, a lifetime with Mercury. He left London a fortnight ago for the fresh country air. Why is he of interest to you? Oh, no reason. I'm more interested in using his shop, only for an hour or so. Would he have left his keys with family in the area? He has none left, but he must have left Hardiman, the cat's meat seller, to oversee his shop. They're in business. They're good friends. Do you know where he can be found? No, but wander around the neighbourhood and listen for his beep beeps. He often passes in front of the clinic. Besides... It's me that you're looking for, sweetheart. Um, actually, no. I am looking for the cat food seller, Hardiman. Hardiman? Poor Hardiman. It isn't quitting time for him yet. That gives me some time to wander the streets before he shows up and with him all the cats hereabouts. Do you know where he lives? Sure. And for a copper I might even tell you. Here are a few coins. You're too kind, Governor. Well, these days, I knows that he lives with his mammy on Hanbury Street, in the same place where Dark Annie bled to death. Why did you call him poor Hardiman? Bah! He's in grieving, of course. Just a few weeks ago, he lost his wife. And three months before that, his girl, poor fella. He was in tatters. He even came to cry on my shoulder, believe it or not. Well, I must leave you. I must go to Hanbury Street. Whitechapel Street. This is the building in which poor Annie Chapman was killed. Baby!
Beep, beep. Hello, are you Mr. Hardiman? That's me. I am Dr. Watson. I have come to see you about Fletcher's shop. I would like to use it for an hour or two, if you have the keys and your rates are reasonable. Do you want to operate on someone in the butchers? Not at all. One of my friends needs it to prepare pig's heads. Well, why not? Fletcher certainly wouldn't mind, but there's a problem. A problem? How so? This morning, the neighbour above broke his key in the door. The old boy must have already had a drink. So? Well, I tried my best to unjam it with Fletcher's spare key, which is pretty thin, and bam, that one broke too. Hard luck, but if you have the end of the broken key, perhaps it can be fixed. It must still be upstairs. I didn't pick it up. Fletcher has a key too, so I didn't think it was a problem. Fancy, if I just had another key with a simpler blade, I could copy it. I'm great at odd jobs. Fine, I will try to find all of that. Well, see you later then. Goodbye, sir. Tell me, is it... Oh, it's so cold. Come, come. Let's warm up. Oh, no. But what a... Oh, how dreadful. Kebabs, the same as Hardiman's, so he prepares his meat here. This bag contains butcher's equipment. My word, these are innards. Where can I find a key with a simpler blade? On a worthless door, perhaps. This key was left inadvertently. Indeed, there is nothing terribly precious inside. But what a stench. Have you found everything I need to remake the key? There you go. I think you'll manage with all of this. I'm sure I will, sir. It won't take me long. Say, I think there's some of your business upstairs. Oh, you're right. I ain't had the time to sort it out. Sometimes I'm in such a hurry to prepare my meat that I forget to clean up. But why do it in the stairwell? Awful bleeds bucket loads, they do, as you've seen. Now, why would I do that in my own lodgings? Ah, of course. But what about your poor neighbours? They owe it to me all the times I've helped them out. And I don't have a shop either. Say, you sell animal meat, isn't that right? Would you know where I could find a dozen small pig's heads? The guy who gets me my offal should have some. I'll pay your day's wages if you meet me at Fletcher's butcher shop in two hours with the pig's heads. Here's a little advance. I'll do my best, Doctor. The caretaker of another building told us that the place where your mother lives has a reputation for facilitating prostitutes' activities. Is that true? Sure, the doors are never closed. They come through here like it's Paddington Station. By the way, I heard about your loss. My condolences. Ta, sir. <laughs> I saw them die slow deaths. <laughs> My little girl, her face was eaten by the disease. <laughs> Thank you, my friend, and please forgive me for bringing up such painful memories. <laughs> Go, I must do my rounds, and I will look for what you've asked for. As for me, I will go and find Holmes, and we will go to the butchers together.
let's return to Fletcher's butcher shop. Your heads are on the block inside. Say, you wouldn't be the same chap who bought my whole load the other day. It's possible, but if you want to continue to do business together, you mustn't speak of my presence in the area to anyone. Don't worry, my lord. I'll be as quiet as a church mouse. Holmes, will you explain the reason and rhyme behind this masquerade? Elementary, we shall conduct an experiment that will allow us to answer a simple question. Does the type of weapon used by the killer correspond to a specific profession? And here are our sow's heads. Congratulations, Watson. You're welcome, Holmes, but what do you really want to do? Take up a collection? There is nothing further to find in this room, Watson. However, I need some knives. Our only hope is behind this door. This wheel is broken and prevents the door from sliding. I need something. There, this door is slightly raised. There is nothing further to find in this room, Watson. However, I need some knives. Our only hope is behind this door. There is nothing further to find. Elementary. While I prepare our experiment, could you find me two knives? A small one, somewhat larger than a pocket knife, with a large, sharp blade. We'll need it to separate the bones and to cut through the thick skins. Then find me a long knife that's at least 13 inches long, no shorter, that's sharp and has a thick blade. Fine, Holmes, but I'd like to tell you about Hardiman. Do you know that he prepares his kebabs himself and... That he owns butcher's tools and uses offal? That's obvious, Watson. Pray, take my magnifying glass and my rule and get started, Watson. Find me these two knives. I am in need of something. With the rule, I must find a large knife. Size, six and a half inches. Size, 13 inches. Size, eight and a half inches. Size, seven inches. Thanks to the magnifying glass, I can find a small knife that matches Holmes's description. Fragments of cartilage. Hmm, large size. Fragments of cartilage. Hmm, large size. Fragments of cartilage. Here are the knives you asked for. Be careful, they're awfully sharp. Holmes, I must say that this experiment is making me rather uneasy, comparing animal heads to these poor women. You're right, Watson, but this somewhat shocking experiment may help to end this massacre and save other victims. You can be sure of that. Look, these pig's heads are still bloody, which will suit our experiment perfectly. I have a pocket knife and a scalpel with me. With the two knives you just brought me, we have a similar array of weapons as those probably used by the killer.
we saw three types of throat wounds on the deceased attributed to this man, those intended to slit the throat, those intended to decapitate, and the more superficial yet mortal wound that led to the death of the unfortunate victim in Dutfield's yard, Miss Stride. With the help of these four knives, we are going to try to recreate these wounds on the pig's heads and see what we can establish about the weapon or weapons used. We may also be able to rule out Miss Stride as a victim of the killer of the other three. Let's try to use these weapons on this head to obtain a large deep wound to the throat, like those that were noted on three of the four victims. This little knife is very sharp and has a very wide blade. This pocket knife is very sharp, but its blade is too thin. The wound is too shallow. Look, Watson, this knife easily penetrates the flesh. Elementary. Let's try to decapitate our victim with these tools, knowing that the killer didn't quite manage to do it. Charming. Look, Watson, this little knife with a wide base can easily slice the vertebrae of our porcine friend. The blade of this pocket knife is too thin to reach the vertebrae. With a scalpel, the wound is too shallow. This knife with a long blade easily slices the flesh but cannot dislocate the vertebrae. The blade of this pocket knife is too thin to reach the vertebrae. Elementary. Let's see if these knives can inflict a mortal wound in a situation where a single quick blow is given. The scenario in question is that of Dutfield's yard. Look, Watson, the blade sinks easily into the flesh. In using the cutting edge of this pocket knife's blade, I can scrape the skin. It cuts through the flesh easily as the blade is so sharp. This particularly sharp blade can make a deep gash with one quick slice. Elementary. That's it, Watson, the big knife. With respect to the opinion of the medical examiners who noted that a butcher's knife with a long blade would have caused the eviscerations on some of the victims, we can assume, Watson, that he only used this type of weapon as it is capable of inflicting all of the wounds displayed. Furthermore, the Dutfield's Yard murder remains attributable, for the moment, to the Whitechapel killer, if we are able to explain why the murderer used his knife in a different manner. Why not go there now? We will try to reenact the killer's actions that night. Our first objective will be to clarify, one way or another, the statements of Constable Smith as well as this Hungarian by the name of Schwartz. We must also try to find out more about the International Working Men's Educational Club, underneath which the murder took place, perhaps at the Wasp's Nest. 
Yes, let's go to Dutfield's yard or wherever, but quickly. I am in urgent need of fresh air. Let's go to the wasp's nest. Don't forget that Bluto may still be hiding here. I will try to find out more inside. You, Watson, must intercept the policeman on his rounds. Given the hour and a bit of luck, it will be Smith. Try to get some information from him. Understood, Holmes. Hello. I know you. You're Squibby's guardian angel. You weren't dressed the same last time, but I don't forget a face. No hard feelings, eh? Join me in a glass? Your Jack the Ripper is on everyone's lips and written in all of the papers. You must be awfully proud of yourself. You have skill, that's for certain. It's a shame you use it to mask rather than discover the truth. You better believe that I'm going to find out who it is. I got a hold of old Schwartz's interpreter. You know, the Hungarian who saw Liz Stride get it. Doesn't speak a word of English. And when he went round to the station, another Jew went along to interpret. I found that bloke, and he repeated everything that had been said at the station. It won't be long before I find these fellows. Why do you say these fellows? Were there several of them? Do you not read the papers or what? Well, given the rubbish that you read sometimes, let me explain. At 12.45 a.m., Schwartz goes down Burner Street towards Fairclough, on the side of the road where the workers' club is. A bit further from there, just near Dutfield Yard's wooden doors, a chap and a lady are arguing. The star said that the bloke wanted to push the girl into Dutfield's yard, but the translator told me that Schwartz saw him pulling her towards the road. She doesn't want to follow. He grabs her by the shoulders and throws her to the ground. She falls. Falls a bit, but not too loudly. Old Schwartz is scared, crosses to the other side but continues in the same direction. The bloke with the girl notices him and yells, Lipsky! At the same time, another bloke at the corner of Fairclough and Burner who was lighting his pipe gets in on the action. He starts coming towards Schwartz in a menacing way, and Schwartz takes to his heels, doesn't see anything else. Once he finds out that a woman got herself killed, he went to testify, and identified Longley's stride as the woman he saw getting thrown about. So there were definitely two blokes, mate. But why... why am I telling you all this? In vino veritas. I'll take my leave then, Mr. Bulling. That's right. Till next time. If you're looking for some company, Gov, you've come to the wrong place. Me? I'm just here to pour. I don't care who you is. I knows nothing and I don't care neither. A draft, my good man. Here, sir. Tell me, was it not a mere stone throw away from here that the Whitechapel killer struck last week? That would be Jack the Ripper, that's his name. Slit the throat of a working girl in a small courtyard over there behind them big wooden doors. Below the workers' club? The very spot, below Lipsky and co. I wouldn't be surprised if Jack was one of them if you catch my drift. Lipsky and company. Do you mean to say that someone called Lipsky runs this club? Nah, it's just that it's full of Jews. In Whitechapel, we call them all Lipskis, like that Lipsky who killed that girl in Batty Street last year. Oh, really? Last year, a Jew named Israel Lipsky killed a lass who was six months pregnant by making her drink acid. One trial and one protest by rabbis later, and he was hanging. By those who don't much like him, the Jews are called Lipskis. Is the term Lipskis used to refer to the Jews in the area, and is this club frequented by Jews? You got it. Socialist Jews, even. They spend their evenings hollering, singing. I've seen them spitting on the bosses. And do you know the victim? No more her than any other. The working girls don't drum up business too much in this street. They need a reason to end up here. Very well. Goodbye. Cheers.
First and foremost, I must find PC Smith. Good evening, Constable. Good evening, sir. I am Dr. Watson. Would you happen to be PC Smith, the man who patrols this beat? That's me. And you work with the famous Sherlock Holmes, don't you? What can I do for you? I believe you were on duty the night when the murder took place here. You would certainly be able to confirm a few details, such as the time of death that the medical examiner gave. It's just that I wasn't there when the body was discovered. I don't think I can help you. But I was told that you had seen the victim that very night. Indeed. But it was before the murder. I saw her, not far from here. She was talking to a man. It was around 12.30 or 12.35 a.m. What did this man look like? I only saw him from behind, really. He was wearing a short black outfit, a small felt hat like a cap in a dark colour, and a white collar. He seemed to be a respectable type. He was carrying a packet in his hand wrapped in newspaper, about 18 inches long and about 6 inches wide. His outfit reminds me of someone that I know. Was he a large man on the older side? I don't think so, no. Even though I only saw him from behind, I would say that he was barely 30 years old, or even less, say 28, or even less, 26 years old, and 5 foot 8 inches tall at the very most. He had a small dark brown moustache and an olive complexion, I would say, but once again, I only caught a brief glimpse of his face in three-quarter profile. Nobody else saw this man? I discussed this previously with Mr Eagle, the president of the workers' club. That night he returned around 12.40am to the club. He used the passage through Duckfield's yard to get into the club because the main door was locked. He can attest that he didn't see anyone else in the passage at that time, but wasn't really paying attention to who else might have been in Burner Street itself. He was listening to the song coming from the club. In short, no one else saw him. Well, thank you for having satisfied my curiosity, my friend. A fine evening to you, Doctor. Field's yard. Here is the workers' club next to Dutfield's yard. Here is the workers' club next to Dutfield's yard. <laughs> 